Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, Valerie, and Laura. And Miss Prompton is at home because we are on location. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy, including, especially today, those passing through Austin. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Launched in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, we like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and we usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interviews a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. Today, by the end of this interview, we guarantee you, this is a comedy wham guarantee, you will be speaking with a Tennessee twang. It's our guarantee. Uh, This comic (laughs) comes to Austin at least once a year and has a cult-like following here in Austin, including Laura and I. And she started doing comedy when her first of three kids were just one year old. And this is an interesting fact that I learned in my research. On the Grabble, she is listed as the number one Christian comic. And we're going to talk about that because... What? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Because having watched her perform, we think she is dirty and filthy without ever using a swear. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and on um, Grabble. What is Grabble? <laughs> We're going to find out, maybe. Okay. <laughs> and she's well. done it all. She has done TV, podcasting, Sirius XM channels, and she's here with us today. So now, Comedy Wham presents Leanne Morgan. Leanne, thank you so much for sitting down with us. <laughs> well, honey, I'm, I've already had a ball. Already. I've, had, I've got Diet Coke and a quesadilla <laughs> in a funky place. I in like, Austin, Texas. Uh-huh. I feel like her twang comment was directed at me because I'm from oh. Southeast Texas. And anytime I'm headed home, have a little to drink, or I'm around someone southern Mine flares up, so <laughs> I may sound different on this interview. Yeah, well, and I don't think that's a bad thing. No, no. Don't either. Oh my gosh, that that Tennessee twang is just the best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And let me say really quick that I have had. You would not believe the people that have always thought, well, that some people have thought this is fake. Mm-hmm. And I think, did they really think I'd fake this? If I was going to fake, I'd do like an Ireland. <laughs> Or uh, something empty. You know, if I if they thought that I had so much energy to fake this, I mean, I'm too tired to fake. I just and I just never. I just always thought it was pretty fun the way I talked. I didn't. I don't know. I had You're you know, very real. Yeah, very I real, think yeah. I think that comes to. In all fairness, there are some mostly gentlemen in the <laughs> industry. Uh, I'll use that term loosely, that do put on an extra layer of twang for their stage persona, and then in real life they are maybe still a little twangy, but not mm-hmm. quite so much. But the first time I met you, I, 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 I spent some time talking to you, and I was like, nope, that she is 100% mm-hmm. genuine. Well, thank you. Because <laughs> when I had all these, these recently these twenty six million views on a clip on Facebook and, the, and YouTube, I, that's the main thing. And people were like, "Oh my gosh, that cheap accent! That's so <laughs> cheap!" I'm like, "What does that mean?" Yeah. And then you know, and, pe- and then people fought for me that I didn't even know yeah. from Arkansas. No, she's uh, real. Uh, so. <laughs> Anyway, that's awesome. I just want people to know this is it. This is the real deal. (laughs) Well, Leanne, I like to kick off my interviews by asking a question. Okay. It's one word to describe your past. My past. Ooh. Um. Can we do it in chunks? I mean, are you talking, all right, like my past... Like my past from 53 years old, my past. Fun, honey, fun. It's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> it every, is. Every time I have to ask it, people just like. Because <gasps> I think there's so many times in my mm-hmm. life, all, everything has been so different. In my childhood, in my, you know, my adult, young adult, and then being a mama. You How know? did you sum yeah. up your childhood? Um, very sweet, farming, uh, very family oriented. I was raised around all my grandparents, great uncles, um, cousins, because it's farming people, so everybody stayed close by. Nobody was transient. 
and you know moving around the country and so uh, it's a town of 500 people and um, you know stuff happened in my childhood that were devastating and traumatic but for the most part I mean loving mom and daddy I've got a little mom and daddy that that everything what do you, what do you want to do we're here for you mm -hmm. what can we do they drove old cars you know, never spent money on themselves, anything they could do so that my sister and I could go to college and, and what they could do for us. Precious. I've got a precious mom and daddy. And I've got a sister that has bossed me and told me what to do all my life, but she loves me and she would whip a circle saw over me. Older sister? Older sister. Oh, uh, there you go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I want to make a presumption, but tell me if I'm wrong. Do you come from a family of great storytellers? Yes. Okay. And uh, my, my dad is wonderful, a mm -hmm. wonderful storyteller. And then my mama, Lucille, is a dazzler. I like to call her a dazzler. She's up at the senior citizens playing cards uh, twice a week, and she gets asked to play seven days a week because she's fun. And she is, like, I remember when we, I was growing up, we'd go to a Tupperware party. Lucille would walk in, honey, with a Winston line, and everybody was <laughs> like, ah! Everybody loved her, and she would work the room and er make everybody laugh, feel everybody, make everybody feel pretty, feel good. That's, that's what she's always done, but so quick-witted and funny, so funny. Her mama, my nanny, who is a mess, was a mess, um... A little farming woman who didn't throw away anything, even used her eggshells from her chickens to fertilize, yeah. um, and could shoot crows off of her uh, clothesline because they were <laughs> dripping doo doo on her panties. <laughs> Tough as a pine knot. Had five children. Adopted the last one, but had four babies. Had them at home, and my aunt Minnie delivered them, and she didn't even have an aspirin tablet. But anyway, yeah, she's a she is a she could make it all in Beirut, but um, very funny, <laughs> very funny storyteller, very quick witted. Everybody loved to be around her too. She was funny, and my granddaddy. Well, they, I mean, really, a lot of funny people mm -hmm. around that made everything out of a joke. Really, mm -hmm. like fun, they really were, and and raised me. My mama raised me on. She let me watch Saturday Night Live. My dad would get so mad, but she loved it, and she would let me watch Nasty. You know, it was nasty. It was nasty, and I'd watch it. She let me watch. I, I was always a Carol Burnett, Lucille Ball, you know, all that. I grew up watching all that. My mom loved it. Now, loved Hollywood. Were you a performer when you were a little kid? Did you have yes. that bug already? Yeah. That, yeah, I would put on like a slip on my head and put put um, bobby pins in and do share, you know, on the coffee table. I had a little pl record player that closed, and you know, it would it put a record in and you closed it and it would play. And I had when she and Sonny and Cher did, uh, when Sonny and Cher did, what was it, Cherokee Nation? And I did a whole very politically incorrect Native American dance, powwow dance, in the living room anytime anybody came over. And my mom would be like, yes. Oh. And would, yes. And my sister's very shy and introverted, and she would try to, to stop me. But I, yes, I'd love to just get up and dance. And, and we were from out in the middle of nowhere, really rural. And my little mama did not learn to drive until she was 43. And Whoa, so, wow. but she owned a business and worked it and ran it. Her and my dad both. But my mom really did all the counting and everything. My mother's very smart and should, and I wish she'd have gone to college. There's no telling what she could have done. But um, she didn't, there was nobody to drive me to dance classes. And the dance classes would have been 30 minutes to 45 minutes away uh, in other big towns, you know, because we were out in the middle of a farming community, and I, my dream was to tap dance. I just wanted to mm -hmm. tap. So we had hardwood floors, and I just tapped all day long. <laughs> Everybody be trying to eat breakfast, and I tapped at them. But, and then I tried to enter myself. I was five years old. I entered myself into the 4th of July picnic, uh, and they've had it for years in Adams, Tennessee, and 
uh, I was going to do, take that little record player, close that, do the Cherokee Indian Native American <laughs> powwow dance, and my sister got wind of it and oh. took me off the roster and said she cannot do this. And I would have, I think I would have won it. Mm. I really would have. I looked at the competition <laughs> and they stopped. And my sister is 56, and to this day, she apologizes to me. Like, every three months, she'll call me and go, I'm so sorry. I took you off that roster. You probably could have gotten started earlier than if I had done that. And I'm like, no, man, thank you for taking me off that roster. That would have been a bizarre sight, me being in the... Because they're selling barbecue, you know, and snow cones, and then I would have been doing a powwow yeah. dance. So anyway, <laughs> so yes, I have always that would have haunted you on yeah, YouTube. That would have haunted exactly. me. <laughs> it would have. Mm. <laughs> you went to college at UT, but not not, not y'all's UT, not our yeah. UT. <laughs> You know, Not y'all, you take. But we reminded of that quickly every, every time, time she's here. And then I remind y'all that the Tennessee Volunteers got y'all out of that mess at the Alamo, or helped slow it oh, down yeah. until he could get to Goliad, which was another Tennessee man that helped. So anyway, yes, and I feel very, um, I do feel a kinship with Tennessee and Texas. Mm -hmm. And y'all know I lived in San Antonio years ago mm -hmm. for about three years. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, but I went to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, volunteers, mm -hmm. and, um, and I, kicking and screaming, I didn't, people from where I'm from, a lot of people now go to college, but back then a lot of people didn't. Went on yeah. and got married, and I was dating a high school boyfriend, and I was so tickled with him, and I was an idiot, and I thought, oh, we don't need to go anywhere. We can raise tobacco and can our own food and have a bunch of little kids and let them play in a Monte Carlo on the blocks. And then I, um, my, he was so smart, so much smarter than me, and said, I'm going to college. And my little mom and daddy said, you're either going to college or the military. And I thought, oh, shit. I can't go in the military. I am so sissy. So I went to, I followed my high school boyfriend to UT. That's how I got to UT. UT okay. was too big a school for me. I was not mm -hmm. academically ready. I came from a little bitty darling sweet school. But I graduated 42 people. We didn't know what marijuana was, but we could not write a paper. It was not <laughs> It was not an academic <laughs> environment. It was a lot of future farmers of America mm -hmm. and home economics. I was still taking home ec, where like one semester I'd learned how to make a pair of pants. And then, I mean, it sounds like something from the 50s, but, no. it, but I didn't have chemistry. I didn't take Spanish. The guy that did teach Spanish, bless his heart, smelled like... Um, Jake Daniels, and at the time, we didn't know. I didn't know what that was until I got to college and went to a fraternity party. I thought, oh, that was what was wrong with that little thing, trying to teach Spanish. So um, so I got to UT and was pretty freaked out, honey, because yeah. I was overwhelmed, and I nagged. I was coming off of my youth fellowship group at the Methodist Church, and, and I had never had alcohol, and so my... A uh, high school boyfriend was two years older than me, and he was in a fraternity. And he was there was whiskey stuck to the floor as you walked by, and it smelled bad. And they were singing. He was on stage singing Rick James songs, "You're a Super Freak" or whatever Super Freak. And he didn't know the words, and I I nagged him and said, "This is evil." And uh, I feel the presence of Satan. <laughs> And so he broke up with me because he wanted to, yes, to have a good time. And, but then later, I mean, threw rocks at my apartment for years trying to get me back. Yeah, so everything turned out fine. But, yes, that was a rocky, rocky little road. And I went for a couple of years, and then I, I dropped out. I got married the first time to a very um, uh, abusive mm -hmm. Um, mentally ill man um, and got married young like at 21 and I really I look back on it and I think I just didn't know what else to do like he had he had come into my life and had swept me off my feet he was very charming he was very good looking mm -hmm. but um, but now I would know you know I would know better very um, controlling and abusive and didn't and isolating me from people that kind of thing and I was so young I just didn't know what in the world that even was 
and would say things to me like, you need diction lessons, you are you sound so stupid, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And so I, f I got out of that about after about two and a half years and fled in the middle of the night. And I went and lived in a motel, and I called my little mom and daddy, and I said, I would like to go back to school, but I'm going to be 26 when I graduate. Now, that's how, you know, in your 23-year-old mind. Right. You think that's old. That's and my little daddy said, you're going to be 26 anyway. You might as well get an education. <laughs> and he goes, of course we'll do it. So they helped me go back to school. And then, um, and I'm telling y'all that because it was such a rocky road. that, And I ended up getting my degree. And I loved my degree. And I loved my department. And I met my husband now. Um, uh, but later, years later, the University of Tennessee, um, awarded me with the Accomplished Alumni Award in 2012. That's and amazing. it makes me want to cry because, it, you know, when you've been through something bad and it wasn't like, I, my kids, thank the Lord, have gone through college. They've not had to worry about anything, worry about working, making money or doing their dad could afford to, you know, we could do everything for them. I always, you know, was having to work and, and my parents paid for my tuition, but I was always, you know, doing apartment, wait tables, yeah. all that. Everything just seemed so hard. Yeah. And then I got mixed up in something really bad, and that was so traumatic, and I felt like such a failure, and then went back to school, ended up getting that degree and wanted to learn then, Luck was ready and, and loved it, but it just was such a rocky road, and then to come back and for somebody to, to give me that award, you know, I just thought, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. so, that, so the University of Tennessee has me go and speak to classes. Oh, and basically, awesome. I, I tell I basically tell these little kids, look, I'm all right. <laughs> You're gonna be all right. Yeah. Yeah. I got a degree in this, but look, I'm a professional comedian, and um, and life takes twists and turns, and yeah. it's all gonna turn out all right. So anyway, that's and University of Tennessee has been very good to me. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, my darling. Did you have throughout all of this time a bug? To get on a yes, stage, yes. And you've not told us what your degree is in, and if you perform like in a formal setting, like school or in college. But I'm just imagining you're hunkering down on the basics as far as a degree. You're not. Yeah. Well, I sure. wanted to be. If I hadn't have been a comedian, I wanted to be a therapist, hmm. a crisis intervention uh, and child and family studies hmm. uh, therapist, child and family therapist. And I got my degree in crisis intervention counseling, and I loved my degree. It was under child and family studies and human ecology. And I, I would go back today. I, that was the most fascinating classes. I loved my teachers, and I love learning about people. And I swear, I think it's helped me in a com as being a comedian because I'm studying birth to death, everything in between there. You know, cognitive, uh, sex human sexuality, the... I can't even, I mean, just everything in a person's life, adolescence, I've gone through all of it. And I think that's helped me have a different aspect or um, uh, look at, on, on look of things in comedy. Well, yeah. one of the critical skills of a comic is reading a, an audience and reading a room. And when you've studied all of that, that gives you a leg up, I would imagine. I would think so. Yeah. I feel like yeah. it has me. But I have to say this, and, and I think... And I was going to say this later, but I'll say it now. You connect not just with the audience, but with your individual fans in a way that I've not seen in many comedians ever. And I mean like a personal relationship. When they walk away from meeting you at, and, or even just seeing you, it's like they have a friend that cares mm -hmm. about them. And... I can see that from the degree, but just in who you are as a person, too. Do you feel that connection to your fans? I do. I do. And if y'all notice, I've been selling t-shirts for the first time, <laughs> and, which is like Waller in a, a body bag across the United States of America. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, I'm going to rethink this thing, because these t-shirts about kill me. But well, anyway, I took one off your hands last ooh, night. Thank so. you, my darling. I hope that big duffel is lighter going home. <laughs> But um, but I think people they love, I enjoy having that T-shirt. And I think it's, it says I'm too fun to clean. And I think that's I don't know something fun women can put their put on, put their hair up in a wad, and watch a Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> but um, 
But uh, yes, I had to get people to help me sell those because when women come out or men, people do tell me things. Like I've had women say to me, my husband robbed a pizza hut last week and I got three babies and I don't know what I'm gonna do. And they're sitting there telling me that and we're holding hands and I want, I would never not acknowledge what she's going through. I don't know, I, I, it's not that I like to hear terrible things are going with people, but I it I can receive it and yeah. it does not bother me. I I want people to be able to tell me something. So, you know, people tell me if they're going through an illness. People tell me if they're going through a divorce. I, people women show me their lower back and their crack and show me a, a operation they had. They want me to see their scar. I will see that scar if you want me to see that scar. <laughs> I just, and let me tell you, when I'm on tour with Country Cool Comedy Tour, there's two other women, they sell merchandise, and they know that I'm the one that's going to be, people are going to come to me and tell me stuff, mm. and and they don't have the kind of personalities, they can't deal with it. God has given me something to where I can I can receive it, and I, I feel like I can love on people, and I want to love on people. I don't want to go through this life and not make connections with people. I am a people person. My mama, where my little mom and daddy had a meat processing plant. That's what they did. They processed everybody's deer, beef, all that in Middle Tennessee and had a very successful business. I would come home from school and Lucille, say, and this was went back when she smoked, uh, Winston Lights, and she would be sitting on the side of her desk and somebody would be telling her, oh, like her, their husband's having an affair or whatever was going on and my mama would be locked in with them and then before you know it they'd be holding hands and I'd be like do you want me to throw out some hamburger meat before you get home tonight <laughs> and you make some spaghetti and she'd be like mm -hmm. so I get that I must yeah. get that from my mama yeah. but she's yeah. very um uh cares about people and you know, but I'm a people person, and my husband introver introverted, and so like if we when we go to church at the at the little Baptist church, if there's an 80 year woman that comes, hey girl, and wants to love on me, he's like, Leah, don't make eye contact with people. We got to get out of here. And I'm like, I, what am I gonna do? Push an 80 year old woman down and not love on her? He goes, you're making too much eye contact with people. I can't help it. I've told him for years, let's drive separate, okay? Get out of my butthole. I'm gonna stay at church and lock this thing down. I'm going to be the last one out of this parking lot. I'm always the last one out of the parking lot. They should give you a key. Yeah. They should give me a key. Lord, You'll no, I don't up. want a key. I don't want a key because if they find out that at the Baptist Church, I'll be doing every women's event. <laughs> I'll be doing everything. No, I don't need to be doing that. Even though I do churches. I perform at churches. Let and I've been. we need to edit that out. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I've been out in California twice in uh, two months and I got other ones I'm doing out um, and, and you talk about a fun time if you get a bunch of women in a church congregation and they've got a taco truck out front and somebody's <laughs> selling Mary Kay and you come out I, you could go boogity boog and they go nuts because they're just wanting to have a good time and it's so sweet because these churches they want these women's events to be fun and they want people to know it's fun to go to church. Yeah. There's fun things going on at church, and so I've been doing a lot of those, and I'm and they are darling. <laughs> I love them. Okay, so anywho, I go off on a tangent. Yeah. I want you to take me back to the first time you went on stage. Yes. To do comedy, what would oh, we see? Lord. What do we see? Oh Lord. <laughs> Well, I was, this was no, there was not a club around. I was in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And um, and I knew in my heart I'd be doing something sometime, but I didn't know what. And by then, I'd married my second husband, and we were up in Bean Station, Tennessee, and he had a, his, a used mobile home business. Well, I was in a Sunday school group with a bunch of people our age, and one of them was in the Kiwanis Club. And he said, Leanne, you're a ham. You know, because I was probably saying stuff in Sunday school. And he said, you're a ham. Why don't you MC our Qantas capers? And I was like, what? And I, so I put on a girdle and <laughs> I went and did it. I guess I did okay, Lord. I hope nobody filmed that. And in that audience was a little man in Marstown, Tennessee, that owned a uh, sandwich and, and beer kind of place. And he came up to me and he said, I've, I've um, booked vans in here. Would you ever want to come and do comedy? So I was like, yes, 
Um, <laughs> and I had three babies. And um, okay, now I'm trying to think though. Did I had I already been selling jewelry? Maybe I'd already been selling jewelry. Okay, let me push back because when when Chuck had this small business in Bean Station, I we needed. Well, he was only 26 years old, and he took care of lots of families that worked for him and, and bought their baby's diapers and their Christmas and all that, and he was awful young to have all that responsibility. Uh, so, so he didn't. we didn't have the extra money for me to get my hair highlighted and stuff like that, so I started selling jewelry. I had my degree, but I did not want to leave my children and get a full-time job. I was breastfeeding them. So I started selling jewelry like women sell Tupperware. Mm -hmm. And I started going around. I sold jewelry to every denomination, every um, uh, first grade elementary class <laughs> teacher thing. Okay. And I was doing, that was my little club. And it was in somebody's living room. I'd go and I'd schlep mm. this jewelry and I'd lay that jewelry out and I'd eat day up. And, um, and I was supposed to be talking about jewelry and do a presentation and I would talk about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids and I resented my husband for not listening to the baby crying in the night and so women started relating to that and I and I think honest to goodness they started booking parties so far in advance to have me because I was funny and like one night a woman peed on the couch and I was like okay I've got it I thought I had it but I've got because later before when Chuck and I were dating we went out to the comedy store out in LA and I would watch comedy and I would think I can do this I can do this but how would I do this oh I'm just from Adams I don't know I'm from the country I've already been divorced I've got you know this past I'm done no you know a woman tells her stuff a bunch of lies I was all up in that so I was selling this jewelry. The company noticed that I was booking so far in advance that they asked me to come speak at things. So I started speaking, and I was supposed to be talking about jewelry, and I'd get up on there and talk about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids. And then somebody said to me, uh, he, he's a very prominent Christian comedian, because that was a Christian company, and he said, you need to do comedy. And that was the first time that I really, I thought, oh my gosh. So, so fast forward, this little man in this town goes, would you want to come and do comedy? And I went, yes. He goes, can you do an hour? And I went, yeah. Oh. I didn't know. <laughs> so he goes, I'm going to give you the money of the, the door. I'm going to keep the money for the beer and sandwiches. And I was like, whoa. Okay, so I go and get my hair blown out at some terrible, <laughs> terrible yes. beauty shop where some little girl gives me like a, like, like a little bouffant something that an elderly woman would have. Oh. And that freaked me out. Then I got I got sick that day, and I thought, I can't move my neck. I really did, and I went to an ear, nose, and throat guy. Somebody got me into this guy who looked like Tim McGraw. And I said, <laughs> I can't move my neck. I think I've got a tumor, and I've got three children to raise. And he went, and he goes, I don't know what is wrong with you. I mean, he che he goes, I don't know. I look back on that, and I know. I was, you know, when you hear people scared stiff, yeah. okay. I was scared out of my mind and thought, why did I say I do this? And I could not move my neck all day. <laughs> then this girl no. gives me this terrible little hairdo that looks like something <laughs> from the 50s. And, um, and I get on stage. And I have a like a music the thing you put music on, and I had a little kindergarten tablet that was my son's, and I just wrote out topics of things that I thought were funny, and maybe I've been saying in a parking lot to a bunch of women at the Methodist Church, and um, and you know it went pretty well. I think somebody filmed it, and that's always haunted me. <laughs> but I did an hour, and the guy liked it, and people, and there's nothing to do in Marstown, so let me get that straight. There was, you know, I was a big deal because there was nothing to do, but I would sell out every time. So it was kind of like a one-woman show. I did it once a month, and but my first time on stage was an hour. Can you believe it? Wow, I, th I looked back on that, and I thought, boy, I bet that sucked. <laughs> and then we moved to San Antonio, and, and my husband sold that business, moved to San Antonio, and I had... Um, River Center mm -hmm. Comedy Club, mm -hmm. and that was the first comedy club I'd really been involved with, and they were not so great to me, and I was very different from everybody, and that scares people. Mm -hmm. And but 
um, you know, I'd get up there and at late at night, and they'd all be it'd be high. Everybody'd be high at midnight. You know, mm-hmm. nothing good happens after midnight, mm-hmm. and nothing good happened in the River Center Auditorium yeah, after true. midnight. No, Everybody true. was just out of their minds, and I'd get up and talk about two do balls and. <laughs> I know they thought, what in the world is this? Because, you know, it's usually raunchy and, you know. But anyway, and then I started going to Austin, and that's when the real stuff started happening for me. I mean, like, and quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, you're you very quick to mention, because we see you at Cap City. Yeah. The Cap City was your first headlining club. That's yes, and she moved me from a opener to a headliner. I never featured. And that was the first time in their history. Mm. And you talking about a rough week that was. I had explosive diarrhea <laughs> every night thinking, what am I doing? Am I supposed to be doing that? Because I just saw that club, and I still think that's one of the best clubs in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I just, I could, I just could not believe it. And I was hysterical. And I tell you who helped me get through it. Scott Hardy. Scott Hardy. Do y'all know who I'm talking about? I don't. Okay, he was a comedian for years, and, and he lives in Bass, Bastrop now, but he traveled all over the world in comedy. But he was working for Margie at the club, and he does the, um, he's been on Ellen, um, he does that voice, Gladys. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's why that name rings a bell. Gladys, okay. okay, and he was so funny, and he would do Gladys and introduce me, uh, because he's from Tennessee, and we just always had a connection, and he got me through that way because I thought I don't need to be here. I don't deserve to be here. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna have explosive diarrhea. I can't. I mean, I was sick to my stomach. I don't know how I got through that way, but I did, and they've had me back ever since. And they're the ones I got my first television deal through them. I mean, I could go on and on. I, they have lifted me up. Margie has believed in me. Rich Miller, they have just been wonderful to me. It still gives me a little street cred to say I go to Austin Cap City Comedy Club. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you're very loved here. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. very Thank loved you. here. Thank you. So, uh, I'm like, <laughs> you have I, yeah. I want to explore something that happened during this introduction that I did because I, I was surprised when I found this little website that said, Leanne Morgan, number one you know, Christian comic, because having seen you on stage several times, I would never, I know you're clean, you don't use the swears, uh, you talk about your faith to some extent, but it's never a, a preachy way, it's just, you know, where where I'm coming from, you know, we don't do the swears, we don't, you know, my faith, and, um, yeah. but you were surprised by this little yeah. tidbit. Yeah, well, I mean, I just know there's unbelievable Christian comics out there now, and I know y'all, I, I know a lot of people are probably like, yeah, right, because it used to be kind of goofball, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, they juggle, and they do, and it's goofy, <laughs> and uh, there are some unbelievable comics out there right now, maybe maybe they don't even know about them yet, but um, that are doing unbelievable things, and getting huge things, and and they're really, what, the, what I feel like Christian comedians are, are just mainstream comics who are believers. So I don't, when I go to these churches, they know that I'm not the kind that's going to get up and do an altar call. There's two types. I don't do that. Mm-hmm. I'll get up there and I do my thing, but I'm a believer. And they know that they don't have to worry about me doing any, you know. And and my church things are kind of different from my, my shows are a bit similar. But a club, I can get a little bit edgier mm-hmm. if I want to. But the church ones, I mean, I do different things for church, for corporate, for law, but not, not not real different. You know, I don't yeah. want people to think, oh, she's going to come in here and do a big, you know, Dave Chappelle in a club, and then <laughs> she's going to go to church and do something different. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very similar, but I just, I know where my boundaries are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I'm not comparing myself to Johnny Cash at all. <laughs> but I'm a big fan, and I always loved it that he said, I'm an artist, and I'm a believer. But I've got to, I've got to be able to talk about what's real. Mm-hmm. Folsom Prison, you know, yeah. people are yeah. in prison. Yeah. People, you know, are in poverty. People, are in, I feel like I'm, I, I've got to talk about what I really feel is on my heart. Mm-hmm. And I know that God knows what that is yeah. and is okay with it. <laughs> I think that's why you connect so well with mm-hmm. the audience is because once they get to know you, they know you're not putting on. They know that, like. Despite the YouTube crazy people, they know 
that's the real you. So, I, I hope they do. I feel like it comes through. So. Well, thank you. I, I have, I think, in all these years that I've been around a lot of comedians, a lot of comedians, you know, trying to make it and all that kind of thing, from the time I got out of that bad marriage, it dawned on me. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm who I'm going to be, and I'm not going to change it for anybody. I was so hurt by all that and so damaged by all that and went into therapy. And, you know, when you've been beat down by a man, you know, I mean, it, a lot of people have been through it. You, it takes a while to get yourself back. And I mm -hmm. thought, once I got myself back, ain't nobody telling me what I can do and what I can't do anymore. I am who I am, and this is who I am. Leave it or you know, like it or leave it is how I feel now. And I think also turning in my fifties, when you do go through perimenopause, that you do get to a, a time where you're like, you know what, I, this is who I am, girl. You do you, mm -hmm. you do you. I'm gonna be me. If you love me, good. If you don't, it's okay. Yeah. I really, you know, I'm past all that of worrying about. What, is, what does Hollywood want me to be? What does that producer want me to be? Right. What should I be for, you know? And, and, and I, have had, I have had so many wonderful opportunities and experiences in comedy. Um, and to be a mama that's raised her children in Knoxville, it's a miracle what all I've gotten to do. And what people, have, people that have lifted me up. And, and I mean, I've met some of the nifty, I mean, the biggest people in comedy ever. And, the, and I've had scripts written for me. And the biggest people in television have written for me. And I've had, you know, Sony Television, ABC, TV Land, Nick at Night. I've been very lucky. I've been in the game. Now, I have not had a big TV hit. They, did, had, they didn't make it. But I can't help but look back on that and think, that's got to be God's protection over me and my family because if I'd have raised my children in L.A., I'd have had a whole yeah. different can of worms, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And I've got good kids, and everybody's, you know, well-rounded and compassionate people and loving, and they don't, they're not into material things, and you know, and they help and they volunteer. And, and not that people in L.A. don't volunteer, but I think that if I'd have raised middle school children through high school in L.A., they would have been different kids. Yeah, yeah. Do you see a shift now that the kids are gone in the types of things you want to go after? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm open to things. I don't know. I hope that if, if I did get a sitcom, one of my good friends is, is in Nashville, is really good friends with Rick McIntyre, and he said that when she did her show that she was so tired she had to go mm. to some little man in Malibu and he had to hook her up to IVs with um, mm. with um, nutrients in them to keep her from going because it's 14 hours a day. Yeah. And that was my dream when I first got started. But now I think, does that really? If Because somebody just approached me about another sitcom and I thought, Lord, I, that makes me want to take to the bed. I would have to get my <laughs> hormones right. And I know little Karen Nickel wouldn't help me get my hormones right, but she'd also say you need to be compliant Leanne and take the supplements I'm telling you and get off of dairy and white flour and sugar but and don't drink red wine but um but the thought of that is not the funnest thing for me I don't know right now that does not set me on fire now TLC reached out to us and wanted to shoot a um, reality show with my family and they came out and shot and oh I, we looked like the most twisted dysfunctional well, this is what was so bad. My, my middle one, who was in a sorority and lived in a sorority house because she was over philanthropy for them, moved her stuff home and then had to have her tonsils out. So we her, we took all, everything was stacked up in her room, and it looked like hoarders. And I thought, after we watched The Sizzle, I thought, this could be a hoarding show. And we're not, well, I do have some tendencies, but we look crazy. And my husband's I already ten him, and like, I'm getting a dumpster. And he looked red in the face. Well, it, they came, it kept going up and going up to bigger executives, and they were like, we love it, we love it. And then they came back and said, you know what? Land's just not mean enough. We need somebody. We are thinking like the Chrisleys. You know, there's just got to be more drama and, you know, throwing somebody's phone in the pond out behind a big fountain. And I just, in my family, we fight, don't get me wrong. We're very dysfunctional, but it's not, it's probably not in an entertaining way. <laughs> so anyway, they, they passed on that. And after that, 
that did not bother me one bit. And I thought, you know, they're in your house shooting right. mm. your panties and your closets. And I'm so, I lowered. I and just trying don't to my... make the worst of it, too. Like, trying yes. to make the worst of it yes. for and a my, story. Yes. And my family has been offered, I was offered, when they were little, I was on Dr. Phil. And Dr. in a comedic setting. And Dr. Phil was a doll. And, um come to find out it was a fan of mine that was one of those things where you're like what <laughs> and uh he was a doll little robin and her little calves and a high heel they were darling and she, and um the uh, producer from wife swap you remember that one uh -huh. i had a meeting with them in la and they go we we don't have a southern voice at, at the time you know then duck dynasty and stuff came out but but there was not a southern family and they were like we like your point of view we want to do a reality show with your family and my children were little and i just could not the, everything that i had seen on tv like that everybody's kids got on something everybody had problems yeah. and and i know life's hard and a lot of suffering you're gonna have problems anyway but i just could not put my children in that mm -hmm. situation I just think it's, it's evil. It's like something doesn't turn out good when it's, you know. No. Yeah. I just don't think well, that's. There's no privacy to grow and change. and. Yeah, and they yeah. didn't deserve that. I, I just, they weren't asking for that, you know. This was my thing. Like Nick at Night put us on TV for Funniest Mom in America and came and watched us. And, and that was all sweet. But, but. You just, my son, who is the old man, you know, the old soul, I remember him saying to me in seventh grade, he goes, Mom, we would all have to fight and people get on drugs and do all kinds of things for them. They won't keep, keep filming us. He said, we don't want to get into that. And I'm like, you're right. We don't need all that. So I've made some decisions throughout my career that, you know, some people may question and think, oh, well, she could have been on so-and-so, but... Well, but I may question it, but I mean, just sitting here for for this amount of time, the amount of times that family has come up for you and how important yeah. family is, it, to me, it doesn't sound like it was a decision at all. It was like, this is consistent with what yeah. I yeah. think family represents. And I just wrote down family first, because that's what I'm hearing throughout this. You've had amazing opportunities. But your family's always come right. first. Yeah. You need like a cooking show or something where you would yeah, have to sacrifice exactly. your soul. <laughs> you can yes. just share a little bit of your family and then be done for the day. So that means yes. you can't sell your t-shirts anymore because... <laughs> you can be with Trisha Yearwood. <laughs> Which I love her. I, uh, I love her I recipes. I this morning. <laughs> I do love her recipes, <laughs> and I sometimes I think her, uh, her and um, what's it, Garth are a little too lovey, um, <laughs> but they didn't have any kids with each other. You know that changes everything. He had kids by somebody else. If she'd had a baby by him, she'd have knocked his teeth out by now. <laughs> You know, that's just part of life. But anyway, yes, and you know, I traveled for years with Paula Dean, yeah, and, uh, and opened for her and. I'd be back there standing, like, doing a pork loin while she was, you know, talking something up in the front. And so, anyway, that, you talking about a grind. It's, those food it's shows, oh, mm. they're like, cut, bring out another cake. Yeah. Cut, bring out the new cake. I mean, it was exhausting. Yeah. And they go make up, and, you know, you think that sounds fun. It's just not, it's I don't know, you fun. know, I don't know what I'd want to do now. I think it's so fun to be with women and be in fun shows at comedy clubs and churches and um, the things I get to do that if I can just find, if my audience can find me and love me what I do, I want to be with them. I think that's probably the most fun. I'm supposed to be writing a book. Oh my <laughs> Lord, y'all, my <laughs> husband will get a beer out somewhere and start telling people, Leanne's got a book agent. Leanne had somebody want to write uh, her, Chelsea Handler's book agent. Oh, wow. And he goes, oh, no, no. She hadn't had time to do that. She's been watching Real Housewives on <laughs> on Bravo. But, but, and then I say to him, when's the last time you wrote a book? You know, it is a big deal. That's a lot. So I'm supposed to be doing that. And I've written a few chapters, and they think they can sell it. So maybe this year... Because the dry bar comedy special has really blown my oh, ear up this yeah. year. So maybe next year I can become more disciplined and sit with a cup of coffee and light a candle yeah. and write so many minutes a day. I'm not that disciplined right now. Let's talk about that minute when you went viral. Like that, that moment. Did you just wake up one morning and go, what happened? Yes, yes. 
<laughs> well, this dry bar is, you know, blowing up everywhere. Uh-huh. But when it when they asked my manager if I would do a special in Salt Lake City with the precious Mormon people, <laughs> he was like, Matt was like, well, Lynn, I don't think it's going to hurt you. You're going to be in Dubuque, Iowa that week. Why don't you just stop by there and do it? Make a little money. You know, if you'll have a nice film. Nobody thought anything about that because mm-hmm. it's not Netflix. You know, nobody had ever heard of it. So I go, okay, I feel fat, but and I put on some <laughs> dark <laughs> jeans and trying to get a top that covered my crotch, and and I got a little spray tan, and, and I had my thyroids nodules had um, were having a hard time, and had one had really swollen, and I hate that I got a tiny little necklace. I had that on, trying to be him, and it flipped it up because my nodule, oh. a gorder, should we say gorder? That's probably a funnier word. Um, but anyway, I stopped by there. I was so tired. I'd been to Dubuque, and I don't even know where all I'd been that week, but I'd had a busy week and flying and multi-city flights, you know, that just sucked the life out of you. So then I go in here to do this, and they said it's got to be very clean. Well, now I'm starting to question, what's everybody's idea of clean? Because, right. you know, Amy Schumer will say the P word. Okay. Somebody said to me one time, Jeff Foxworthy gets a little racy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What has Jeff Foxworthy said? Well, he has, his wife has estrogen. Okay, well, if that's dirty to you. <laughs> oh my gosh. So things like that start getting in your head. And the, the dry bar thing really messed with a lot of comedians' heads because they were like, you know, this is a, a Mormon company and we're trying to do this. Um, it's got to be clean. But now they're saying, oh, my gosh, we, we didn't mean for that to mess with people's heads because... What their idea, we could talk through that and, and it wouldn't be as, you know, terrible as you think it's going to be. Because it scared a lot of comedians away. They were a little more middle of the road than you thought. Yes. Oh, yeah. Now, they didn't want any language or anything. Right. But, like, I do this whole bit about my my middle one cheered for competition cheer mm-hmm. when she was in middle school. And, and they put a whore outfit on her. Well, I would have never done that at Dry Bar before I knew about Dry Bar, but then the Dry Bar guy goes, oh my gosh, she should have done the whore, you know. So, <laughs> because she wasn't a whore, it was just they put a whore outfit on her, you know, <laughs> and sexualized little children. So, um, so anyway, I did this, this thing, and they were precious people. I did two sets and um, a 40. The audience was wonderful, wonderful. I came out of there... But going into it, I thought I was going to pass out. Going, worried, is do do an ugly word? I mean, what is it? Can I say, you know, estrogen? Can I say? So, um, so I don't even know what I did. And I'm sure it was not my best work at all. I know it wasn't. But I got through it. And then they started seeping out those clips. So that one, I mean, some of them, you know, are at three million, two million, and you're like, what? Because that's a that's, that's a, a blessing. Mm-hmm. Then that one about my middle one being mean when she was in high school and <laughs> was turning mean on us must have resonated with people. That one has over twenty six million views, Jeez. and that's when all of a sudden I had like trolls. You know, and saying horrible things, but I didn't read a lot of that. Right. I really didn't. Like it got me freaked out, and then I thought, Blake Shelton, Carrie on I've seen them read all that mess on Jimmy Fallon or what, or Jimmy Kimmel, and so I thought, okay, that's just going to happen. That's okay. So I didn't read the rest of them. And one of my friends, though, who, honey, she can. If you want somebody to cut somebody down with words, get her. <laughs> she she got mad. And started, like, trying to, she was in the band, um, getting over an illness. And so she was sitting there trying to contact these people that had been mean to me. And I was like, really? I'm okay, Emily. But she said to one woman, a woman named Mona said, that she is so not funny. It's unfortunate that I even stopped by here, to, or stopped through, stopped here and listened to this. A big waste of time. And Emily goes, you know what's unfortunate? That your mom named you Mona. Yeah. I said, Emily, <laughs> Emily, honey. Emily stole my job. <laughs> I said, Emily, you got you got to let go and not 
you know, because she was sitting in the bed ripping people new buttholes. And I mean things that would scar her thing on the rest of their lives. I mean, I thought, they don't want to mess with her. And then my daughters were like, this makes me so mad. And I go, everybody, we need to just not look at those. But that, and then my manager was like, oh my gosh, Lynn, like you two people are subscribing to you. We did not have all that in place like we should have because we're old school. And, um, and so I wish I'd have done a better job of having like two, my, taking two Facebook pages and melding them together at first. So, because I just did not understand how right. big a deal that was yeah. that 30 million people now know who you are and are passing your stuff around in Minnesota to the soccer moms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was moms were, it, it yeah. was all over Hawaii, the UK. I would get messages from people. Oh my gosh, this is my daughter. Then I also got a lot of people, and let me just say this. I got a lot of people that said, you know, you should be ashamed of making fun, a ch uh, making fun of children with disease. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they go, y your daughter has, oh, and I can't even remember what it's called. It starts with an M, and it's when you can't take sound. Because in that bed I talk about oh. now, she didn't want me to chew. And they said, that is a disorder. Mesophonia? Yes, yeah. and I said, thank you so much for your concern. <laughs> but she does not have that. And um, she just was smart aleck she and a butthole. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and I thought, do people, that kind of got on my nerves because I thought, it hurt me because I thought, do people think that would actually make fun of a child with a disorder? I, they, I don't, I would never do that. So that kind of stuff with my manager going, we got to get your YouTube. You got to do blah, 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 blah. And then offers coming in. Let me tell you what it did. I swear, I, it gave me the shingles. I got the shingles oh my right after it. Wow. And um, on my face and up in my scalp. And, and I think it was just the stress of, and it was all a blessing, don't get me wrong, but it, but it all came so quickly that it, uh, I, I guess that's how my, I've had them before, and I think that's how my body reacts to things. So then I had the shingles, and I had to go do a show for AARP at the oh Dolly Parton Stampede in and they and I go, I don't want to give these old people the shingles and they're like, just don't rub up against somebody. So I said, Well I don't plan on rubbing but you know but I, everyone wants to grab But you know that you, I realize people do want to rub up against me. But anyway I had to keep my I had to go from this side and they but I was um I had the shingles about a month, and I thought, Lord, well, this is going to kill me. And then it didn't, and now I'm okay. And now we got a better grasp on it of what you need to do in place of when there is 30 million hits. But it's been but it's been wonderful, too. I mean, wonderful. Like, I've had people say the sweetest things, like, oh, my gosh, this is my daughter, and I sent it to her, and she goes, oh, Mom, that's crazy. That's me. You know, it's been in a loving way yeah. that mamas and daughters can connect. So... So anyway, yeah, that has been a blessing. That just came out of heaven, and I, I hope other comedians get to do it. You know, now they're now people are wrestling trying to get one of those specials because they're getting so much exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's called So Yummy. Mine's called So Yummy, and you can only you can download it for ninety nine cents, and uh, and I think people are uh, sharing those clips and everything. But I think people have not gotten the. Uh, information really or don't understand you can go and see the whole special for 99 cents yeah. are you starting to see the ripple effect of that at your shows like you were saying the moms from minnesota showing up yes because I, I there was clusters of women at your shows last night there was like big group you could tell at first i was like is that another bachelorette party and no it was just a group mm -hmm. of women that came out Yes, and you know, I found this. I think it's a bunch of women the same age together coming out, and then I see a bunch of women bringing their daughters mm -hmm. because of that clip. <laughs> and and they've got a good attitude. But, you know, nobody's man. Right. They're just like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, this mm -hmm. is Tiffany. Look, here's my mean Tiffany. Like, they'll say that to me. And be, like, here, look here, she's so hateful. And, and the little girl go, I was so hateful. And I've apologized for it. I mean, it's that kind of thing. It's, oh, it's really that like a fun your thing. Daughter? Yes, she said, I know, Mom, that I was so hateful. And she, and she is now, when she's about to start her period, and she'll go, she'll go, watch out. Because she, 
looks at me and then just wants to kiss me in the mouth. It's just just crazy. <laughs> she said to me last night, I, she got her wisdom teeth cut out yesterday, and she it's said, FaceTime me tomorrow, girly. So we're like, we're like best friends. She's uh -huh. 22, so we're coming on to the best friends. Yeah. But I, still things I say irritate her so bad. And But we laugh about it. Like she'll say, I know that was mean. And, she, and then she'll call me the next day and go, I saw my period girl. That was what was happening. I go, I figured that was. <laughs> but if I say, are you about to start your period? <laughs> she goes, Mom, <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> she lives in Chattanooga now. She lives away from me. but um, And she's dating a boy, and she's crazy about him. And, and when any time mine ever start dating anybody, I, I just bucket. I'm like, they're not good enough for you. <laughs> Nobody is. And then I, I go through these whole stages with them. And then, then I, but I don't fall in love with anybody like I used to because she's had a lot of, lot of suitors. So I'll, she'll date these precious boys and I'll, you know, make them a casserole and I'm tickled enough and I, I fall in love with them, love their mom and daddy. And then she breaks her heart yeah. and stomps on them. <laughs> And then I have, I, and then I'm broken hearted, and I never get to see them again. So I don't make eye contact with anybody until somebody's about to go down the aisle. I, I can't, honey. I've been through too much. I've been through too much. And then my baby child, the one that's going to New York to makeup school, mm -hmm. honey, she loves a man. She loves a man, and so she messes with the ones that the other one dates. Like she'll say. Oh, you beautiful thing. I can climb you like a tree. She's the one that spell cusses, and we've let her do whatever she wanted to. If I did that bit she in front of y'all, she spell We We do not allow these children to curse. I know they're doing it out in public or, or with their friends. They're grown, but I don't want them to cuss in my house. And so she spell cusses, and we would never have allowed the first two. But that third one, well, the first two, we wouldn't let them say but or call somebody stupid. And then this baby comes in and goes, hey, mofos, and um, dad, you a-hole, you freak. And he just gets so tickled. And my other kids get so mad. They're like, why do y'all let her do that? The She's child. the baby, you know. <laughs> and we've just given up on her. <laughs> but she'll say terrible things to Maggie's boyfriends, like, because she's, right now she's dating a baseball player, and he's, he's stunning. And um, she'll say, you're Lance. Look at those lads. I could climb you like a tree. And he's shy and introverted, and he just smiles at her. But anyway, she's, a, she's so funny and a booger. I mean, she is so funny. But, and a gifted, very gifted makeup artist. We're very excited for her in her next endeavor. So. Now, have any of them gotten the performance bug? Um... No, and my, okay, my boy, absolutely not, even though he's a writer, right. he's a writer, and he writes and has been published, and so I think he's very creative, and I, I think that he would someday like to, to write books, probably on Southern Appalachian history and woodworking, <laughs> um, but he writes for outdoors platform, outdoor platforms and all that, it's just putting published in a magazine, um, so he's creative. And he's very funny, but he would never want to be on stage. And got asked to be in Tom Sawyer when he was in high school. And he said, this was the worst time of my life. Aww. He goes, and I'll tell you why. He goes, everybody's hysterical. All of his friends, you know, and the girls that are theater girls, and they were chewing him out. And he said, I don't like conflict. And then the, somebody had built some kind of rickety-looking fence on the stage. And he'd say, somebody didn't build that fence right. Somebody's going to get hurt. So that just... <laughs> He just said, I don't, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's all wrinkledy looking and I can't do it. And then my people begged my girls to be in musical theater in our little school because they are funny and they can kind of carry a tune. And, but my girls were athletes and played volleyball and they, I don't know, they thought they were too cool for school and would not have ever done that. And I wish they had them because I did it in high school and I loved it. But the baby, uh, um, let me go back. The middle one got her degree in communications and does speeches and has done so well that they put her in the visual textbooks doing speeches. And wow. her uh, dean of communications has included her in a lot of things like that because she speaks so well in front of people. But she's more of a business person. She doesn't want to do it for, you know, be. Now, when we were all filming for TLC and 
everybody was doing all that. They were they yeah, said we we'll do it. You know, mm -hmm. if it comes to us, we'll do it. The baby child, I think, has got more uh, the potential to do comedy, and I don't think she has the confidence right now. But she knows she's funny. She got funnies in high school. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks she's funny, but she she has not had a desire like I had. And someday it might. And I've often wondered if she were on set somewhere doing makeup. If yeah, she got discovered yeah. because she is so funny and got such a presence, but she's got a huge voice that could be on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but right now she just wants to do. She wants to be on the other side. But while she's doing your makeup, you'll laugh so hard you can't get your brain. I mean, that's that, that's what she does. You'll be laughing and she'll be putting a hairpiece on you, and you'll about lose it. I have to do the eyes last. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But you know, I've all, people said to me, "Do you want them to be in it?" And I, this business is so hard, and I know life is hard, and every job's mm -hmm. hard. But but it's a heartbreak a lot of times. I've had a lot of disappointments and a lot of highs. Yeah. But it's highs and lows, mm -hmm. and you got to be able to deal with that. You know, disappointment and people saying you're not what we want, mm -hmm. you're not this, you're not that, or or you're the best thing that's ever happened, then the next day you can't get arrested. I mean, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to go through. And I think I've been okay and hadn't ended up on dope or out here doing God knows what because I've had my children to fall back on. I've been busy with children. If it had been just me and I'd had all this rejection and all this kind of stuff, I don't know what I'd have done. I mean, I can understand how people have to numb themselves and do and but I've I have had families a family with I've got clothes to wash, dogs to take to the van. I've been too busy, honey, to get in a bad <laughs> in a bad state, you know? Because I, I've I've got my family first. Thank yeah. the Lord. If I'd have been twenty and had gone out to LA with what I'd been through, with and even after that first oh, yeah. husband, what I'd been through, I don't know what had happened to me. Yeah, I had yeah. self-esteem as low as you could go. I dated men that you wouldn't wipe your feet on. I took crap from people that I should have never. But I, I, know, I know that was God's protection because I would have never, it wouldn't have been good for me to be in Los Angeles with that. I was lost and broken. And that wouldn't have been a good place to be in. Yeah. Now, you can't break me, honey. <laughs> you can't break me. I could go anywhere and do anything. And I, I, I believe that I could make the best decisions for myself. And, and I would be safe in anything that I did. And I think a lot of women have to get to that point. You know, it takes different ages. Yeah. Where... Honey, I'm not going to let anybody run over me anymore, you know? I, I'm secure enough yeah. in myself. Yeah. Do, you, do you mind if we explore this thing that I would mentioned before we started to record? Because, I mean, you've just given an amazingly inspirational message here. <laughs> oh, you are part of Southern Fried Chicks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And... I was. I was. Okay. Yeah. And that went on tour... Uh -huh. Kind of exploring that that southern charm comedy style, mm -hmm. but there is a counterpart in the redneck comedy crew or redneck comedy tour, and those are household names. Yeah, blue collar guys, mm -hmm. and we started big, uh, Southern Fried Chicks because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as a, as a female comic, and us as fans, we see. You know, we see the disproportion in who's who's on stage, male versus female. Uh, do you think about what your role could be as a female comic to inspire other female comics? Do you did you ever think about the fact that these guys managed to become household names, but not Southern Fried Chicks doing yeah, you know, at, at a surface doing the same type of thing yeah. Well, and, and we were, in our height, we were doing about 100 dates a year, and we okay. were getting um, beautiful theaters all over the United States mm -hmm. and North America and stayed busy. And it was a hard time for me because that was I had little children staying. I had maybe one in elementary and two in, in, mid, in um, middle school or vice versa. So I was gone a lot, and, that, and it was, and we had a wonderful 
chemistry between the three of us, the original ones. Mm -hmm. And Etta Mae was kind of more, she was more known. I was new, really, and I opened. Well, it was, you know, three of us, so I, I opened, and that's where I feel like I got my seasoning. And Karen Mills, who is a veteran comedian, so funny, and then Etta Mae. And we were all very different. And they called us Urban Suburban and Plain White Trash because we were all so different. <laughs> and um, and we sold out. And I mean, and really, there was not a big name. I mean, Etta Mae had, uh, had a lot of experience in clubs, but she wanted Jeff Foxworthy. I think when they got Jeff Foxworthy to do that, he was already mm. off the chain. Mm -hmm. So I think that helped them become the, you know, have the notoriety because it really made Ron White and Larry, you know, they weren't really known. So Jeff Foxworthy was though. So we didn't have that big a name, but we got booked and we would sell out everywhere we go. Well, they would announce Southern Fried Chicks and people would just laugh and do. It was, the name was great. Everything was great. This is what happened. I got a deal with ABC and Warner Brothers for my own sitcom. And Paula Dean was going to play my mother, and it was going like gangbusters. And um, what ended up happening to it was a writer strike hit. Do y'all remember that? Oh, and so yeah. and one day it was dead. Shut everything off. Shut everything off. But I think if that hadn't happened, I think that had a big chance of making it. Mm -hmm. So I was in deals with them, though, with ABC and Warner Brothers. And CMT came to Southern Pride Chicks and wanted to do a special. And they thought that that special, putting that on CMT, because, you know, the Blue Collar guys had been mm -hmm. on Comedy Central and then CMT yeah. and played it over and over mm -hmm. and over again. So we had never had that exposure. So CMT wanted to shoot a special. And at first, they didn't think they wanted me and Karen. And then they came back and said, we want Leanne. Well, and they started auditioning people in L.A., for our spots, and we had built that. We had built that, and I had missed, I don't think I missed anybody's birthday, but I mean, I missed my children's programs at school. I mean, we, we did, went through blood, sweat, and tears to build that. Mm -hmm. And um, so CMT comes in, just like, and I know this sounds, but I'm just gonna be honest, a lot of these networks come in and just ruin something. Mm -hmm. We had a chemistry. People loved us three doing it, the original ones. CMT came in, and Karen, they, I don't know what they thought about Karen, but they didn't want Karen at all. They just automatically took Karen out and, and really took away her livelihood. Mm -hmm. Then they, and, they, and let me tell you this, the guy that wanted to do all this is not even with CMT anymore, and within four months, he was gone. So people, they come in and screw everything up and then just take off. So it's, that's how that, this business works. Mm -hmm. It's awful. So... CMT wanted to do this special. They start auditioning people in L.A. to take our spots. Well, then they come back and they said they want me to do it. Well, then Warner Brothers said, "I don't want. We don't want you to be on CMT while we're doing. We're you're going to be on major network. We're developing this sitcom. We don't want you to do it." So they asked me not to do the special, which was like fine. Which was fine because I'm telling you, I knew from the word go. They're they're about to blow this thing up and they're gonna ruin it and I don't wanna be involved. I could see the writing on the wall. They took me out on a couple of dates with some of the new girls that they mm -hmm. put in it. And they're all precious, don't get me wrong, but it was just not the chemistry. It was just not the So they did these other people did this CMT special and it bombed. It was a major disappointment. And so from then on, I mean it was over. So I think, this is what I think, I don't know that if we'd have had a big name like a Jeff Foxworthy, maybe something would have blown up before then and it would have gotten bigger. But I think we, if, if, see, if we had stayed the ones that were on it, the ones that had the chemistry, I think that we would have, been there. I don't know that we'd have been blue collar, yeah. but we would have had a long run, a big right. run, mm -hmm. a successful run, because we were making more and more money, selling out everywhere we went and all that. And it was very devastating at the time, because we had tried to build this thing, and then somebody from the outside comes in and blows it up. It was hurtful, but, but now I look back on it, and that time, you know, that was a good time. It was what it was for mm -hmm. what it was, and... I learned from it, and I'm okay, and I'm, you know, that has been, and so then we went on a tour, some of the other ones, we do a little tour, Country Cool Comedy Tour, and um, 
hollerback girls is what's called holler, but holler like the mountain. <laughs> hollerback yeah. girls. And, oh, that's so, great. And, and we really do it. You know why we do it? We love to do it, and we love to do these little theaters, but we like to travel together. It's like having your best friends, and you go to these little towns, and you eat at the Ruby Tuesdays, uh -huh. and you go to Target, and you're like, oh, you use that nail polish. I like this. It's a roving slumber party. It huh? is. It is. And we enjoy it, and that's why we do it. But but let me say this that Brett Brett um oh what is Brett you know the she was a very famous oh, yeah. but Be Brett Butler Brett Butler huge name put her name on a little tour with some women around the same time mm -hmm. as Blue Collar and it didn't do anything yeah so you know who knows what's gonna hit mm -hmm. and lightning in a bottle that Blue Collar was lightning yeah. in a bottle mm -hmm. but what was so fabulous is that I am managed by. Uh, Matt Vanderwater and he was with that whole blue collar thing so I was managed by the same people mm -hmm. and so I got that all that all helped me I mean I've worked with Larry and Jeff and mm -hmm. you know I've had opportunities probably because of being in with those guys yeah. so it all turned out all yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> there were times when I was bitter and I thought why would the little man come in here and not even know us and blow this thing up but that's just you know that's some of that Hollywood stuff yeah. people think they know what they're doing they don't mm -hmm. it's a fickle yeah. industry it is and chemistry is important mm -hmm. having people that get along and love each other and you can tell they do because mm -hmm. I think the blue collar guys you can tell they really enjoy each other yeah, yeah. So, and people like to sing that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but that was that scandal. <laughs> well, Southern fried right. chicks. You're welcome. We ate a lot of good food, honey, on the road. Oh, These little That's... theaters would fix us big spreads like a funeral. And I, we would aim and, you know, and just kiss some little 90-year-old man that's in charge of the thermostat. I mean, we had a ball. We had a ball. We've been in every theater all over the United States. Oh, and met precious people. Like, I met this elderly little couple. I think they were t Tuscaloosa. And they look like little cowgirl and cowboys. And they go, do y'all like, uh, do y'all believe in spirits? And they were telling us about the <laughs> ghosts. And they have seances. I'm telling you, I've met all kinds of people. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, we're going to start winding down. But I will yield the floor if you want to ask. I just have to say that this quote kind of came into my head, and I'm probably going to totally bungle it, but I have to say this, that I, I think of you um, in the way that you talk about how your confidence has come out over the years and how you connect with people, and I know I keep going back to that. Um, I feel like how they say uh, you let your light shine, and it gives others permission to shine too. Well, thank you. And that's how I feel about you. Thank Aww. you, my darling. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I, I've got a lot of issues and a lot of problems and a lot of flaws. I do. But I feel like, and I, it comes from my little mom and daddy, they have always taught me to be kind. And I've never wanted to see somebody wilt. Yeah. You know? I don't like mean people. I thought about getting a t-shirt that says, Nobody <laughs> likes a butthole, but I thought that could be construed in, in a bunch age. of different ways. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, my angel. I don't want to see somebody wilt yeah. in my presence, mm -hmm. and I know people who do that. Yeah, and I don't understand it. I've never understood it. Yeah, and if there's anything I've ever given my children, I be kind to people and compassionate, and and um and yeah, let people be in your light yeah. and be a light. Good night. The world is a dark place, honey. Mm -hmm. And I want to mm -hmm. be a light. And I do think, because I do have, I do, the Holy Spirit lives in me. And He loves me and has forgiven me for all the things that I've ever done. He knows my darkest hours and loves me anyway. <laughs> and I feel like that light comes through. It does. Because the Holy Spirit loves everybody. So, thank you, my darling. <laughs> you angel from heaven. Thank you. <laughs> and you know my love language is words of affirmation yes. and so you have filled my yes. love tank oh. you know maybe I won't have to go somewhere and eat a chocolate bar to try to to fill this gap because you've given me so much love uh, and thank you Valerie I will yield the floor back to you <laughs> and now for my very clinical final question <laughs> 
I want to get a diagnosis. No, I did, would like a diagnosis. I love all that stuff. Oh, no. I don't understand kind people. <laughs> I'll translate later. Thank you. <laughs> My final question. One word to describe your future. I'm going to say love. And I'll tell you why. Because I bet I got a bunch of grandbabies coming. <gasps> oh, exciting. That's what I'm excited. Because my children <laughs> are at the age where, you know, they, they're finding their, you know, if they're going to end up with a spouse or whatever, and I'll have one child married. And that's what I look forward to. And that's what I think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be a meemaw. <laughs> and I'm going to be cooking pinto beans and they can let their baby off in the yard. I'm that kind of, I'm going to be that kind of grandmama because my mama, Lucille, has just loved all my kids and you, honey, take a bucket of chicken and get in the van and watch Disney. <laughs> Mamma will bring you a ginger ale. I'll be that kind of grandmama and I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait. Honey, because I love a baby and I love my kids and I've got three fun, yummy kids and I've got a yummy daughter-in-law so y'all would love her <laughs> so fun you know when you you meet people and women and they're like okay they're girls they're my girls they, they're not you know some women can't get along with other women she's a girl's girl like people that were in her wedding were from elementary middle school camp college and you could just tell people love her mm-hmm. and she could keep relationships and build relationships so anyway, and I feel like me and my other ones are that way, but I feel like there's going to be a lot of love to come, mm-hmm. and um, and I'm going to get to enjoy that, honey. I love it. And if and I hope, I don't know if it's going to be on TV. I kind of <laughs> hope that. I kind of think that my hormones are too messed up for me to be on TV, and my thyroid needs to function a little bit better. Unless they would just shoot me for like two hours a day, and I didn't have to do my makeup, then maybe I might do it. <laughs> well, y'all are darling. I'm going to give this a shot, okay? okay. So bear with me. Okay. I'm going to try this whole words of affirmation thing so I can overflow your love tank. Okay. okay. I love that in over a hundred interviews that I've done, your future word has nothing to do with comedy. And yet here you are touring the country. You've got a viral video. You have a podcast, which by the way, we haven't mentioned, but maybe on on the outro, we'll sing together, sweaty and piss, (laughs) sweaty and piss, menopause makes you sweaty and piss. And I think that's one of the, a beautiful moment to know that if you stay grounded and if you focus on the important things, all the other things will fall into place. Well, thank you. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Because I, that does mean more to me, you know. Mm-hmm. And that comes the comedy, yeah. yeah. If that comes, yeah. yay. But, but yeah, family. I want to be with my kids yeah. and my grandbabies <laughs> and some dogs. And I'll let their daddy come if he'll be sweet. If he's not grumpy. <laughs> if he'll take his testosterone. Pellets or whatever they are. He, he gets grumpy if he doesn't have them. If, he, if I could just make him a cheese tray with some nice bread and butter pickles on it, a couple of gluten free crackers, and a sparkling water, then and give it to him like almost like a tiger in a cage, we can keep him tickled. <laughs> while the rest of us just dance and sing and twerk and do. You can slip one of those pellets in a piece of cheese. <laughs> That is a wrap on Comedy Wham Presents. Leanne Morgan. Leanne, take a few moments now and promote, promote, promote. Tell us about this pop podcast. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so this is with my nurse practitioner who is one of the most brilliant people I've ever known in my life. And she was supposed to go to medical school. Somebody heard her sing. She decided to become an opera singer and was on Broadway. Oh and her married uh, her husband, who is an opera singer, they had they were touring Europe and, and lived in Manhattan. They had Forrest, and she said, we didn't want to raise him around a bunch of old opera singers. So they <laughs> moved to Knoxville, where her husband is the voice professor um, at UTK. And she said, here he moved me into Manhattan, and I am by myself with this little child, and what am I going to do now? So she she's brilliant. She went back and got her nurse practitioner so quickly. She does hormones. She's a hormone guru. She, I said she can't take new patients. She has 4,000. Wow. 
Yes, no, she's got doctors over. Nobody cares about them. Okay, so she's saying, I said, why don't we do a podcast? So we talk about, it's called Sweaty and Pissed, Menopause and More. And she did the, um, Forrest wrote the tune, and she did the song. So she's the voice. She's the voice. Ah. That's her. And she goes, Sweaty and Pissed, Sweaty and Pissed. Because she goes, Lynn, do you want to sing it? I was like, no, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> but the man who did our graphics is the guy Glitterville. You can find him on Instagram, Glitterville. And he, all of his ornaments are in anthropology stores, hallmarks. Oh, he is the most creative person you've ever, he just all wow. over in the Philippines going to these fancy opera singers' weddings and he does all their, <laughs> and, he, and he helps Oprah. He's with Oprah doing oh, her goodness. magazine. He helps, um, uh, all the design and all that with her. So he did our graphics. So we were very lucky to get him. And um, so we've been doing this, and people seem to really like it. I do not add anything medical. <laughs> I talk about my vagina, my butt, my bladder, my odor, my, you know, I'm going to kill Chuck. He's going to kill me. The dogs are in the bed. The, mm -hmm. You know, I'm sweating. I'm going and she goes through all the medical things. And she's very one of those people that thinks outside the box. Mm -hmm. She's not to not sound like a conspiracy theorist, but big pharmaceuticals, she's like, we're, we're putting people on medication that they really don't need to be mm -hmm. on, that they could be taking vitamin D, something mm -hmm. simple as yeah. milk thistle, as, you know, doing this, doing that. So we talk a lot about food, beauty products that are getting our hormones imbalanced, a terrible thing that people just don't tell people yeah. and if you knew it would make your life so much easier and so you feel so much better so anyway we started this i think we've got 14 episodes or something mm -hmm. like that and um it's going pretty well honey we got people mm -hmm. and a poor thing i i said on a video i had to explain women push podcast button because <laughs> everybody my age doesn't know they go oh i'm gonna watch that and i go girl you can't watch it <laughs> so i've had to explain how to push the button i'm gonna have to do that again because everybody asked me but um, what was I going to say? Uh, Anything else you want to promote? Well, oh, just look at, okay, LeahMorgan.com. I've got tour dates coming up all next year. If you want me to come to your um, women's event or all that kind of thing, just go to LeahMorgan.com. I do all those kind of things. I do corporate. I'll do a lot of corporate for a lot of private corporations. People hire me to do fundraisers for breast cancer, ovarian I'm your girl when it comes to all that too. Women, uh, women's fun across the United States. So I do. I'm a jack of all trades. <laughs> if you put a taco truck out in front, honey, I will come and dazzle and tap and do. I don't do balloon animals, but close. So I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? I don't guess so. You can hear me on Sirius XM every day, and and um. And my YouTube channel. People can see all that's new to me. Yeah. It's like voodoo. So, <laughs> YouTube channel, you can subscribe to that and be uh, and like all my, all that social media, fan yeah. page on Facebook and all that. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I got off that Snapchat. It made me nervous. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't know why they, people even have that. I don't need bunny ears. I don't need bunny ears. <laughs> Even though the one that where it was kind of like the flat family stone, that one was pretty nifty. But I but I just couldn't take all that. So I'm on everything else though. Sounds Excellent. good. We hope you've enjoyed learning about how Leanne got to be the comedic genius that you heard today, <laughs> just as much as we have. Be sure to visit comedywham.com. Give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at comedywham. And like our Facebook page. You can listen to past interviews on iTunes and our favorite podcast, your favorite podcast player. Review us while you're at it. This has been Comedy Wham Presents Leanne Morgan with Valerie and Laura. And thank you so much for joining us. Honey, thank you for having me. I've had a ball. Yeah, that's been funny. Thank I know, you. It's Leanne. like having lunch with your best friends. <laughs> <laughs>